Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to this edition of Event World Talks. I hope you've all been enjoying your networking. We'll just wait for Elaine to um, join us up on our digital stage. And so just to go through some housekeeping items while Elaine joins us. There we are. Hi, Elaine. Hiya. If anybody would like to ask a question, um, you'll see the Q&A function. It should be just on the right hand side of your screen. If you can put some questions in there. And um, if anybody likes somebody else's question, you can vote on it very similar to what you do with Slido and then it pushes those most popular questions up to the top and we'll go through those. Um, we're gonna kick off now. We're gonna chat for about half an hour, um, myself and Elaine, and then we'll go into Q&A, um, if that sounds okay. Excellent. But Elaine's here. I'm delighted Elaine has joined us. Um, and we're going to be talking about managing stress in difficult times. And I think we could quite safely say that um, this time that we're in is possibly one of the most difficult and challenging that the event industry has ever faced, certainly in, in my career. Um, so I should imagine that would mean the careers of, of most of most of the guys that are watching here today. Um, so with Elaine, it, it's it's great. It's great to have you here with us today. Do you want, because you have your own personal story as well, don't you? Did you want to give a little bit? Yeah, that? share that with you all because you're probably wondering why am I here and why am I talking um, to a, a load of event professionals? Um, my background is in events and hospitality. 30 years of my life has been spent in the industry. Um, I've worked at the Olympics. I've worked in the European Games in Azerbaijan. So I've had my, my fair share of event experience. Um, but earlier on in my career, when I was in my early 30s, I'm 44 now, I had really bad stress. I had chronic stress that I was completely oblivious to. Um, and I was suffering with panic attacks. I thought it was just because I didn't have enough sleep or I drunk too much. Um, I also then developed totally debilitating irritable bowel syndrome. Now, if anyone's ever suffered with anything with their, their guts, it's really not a pleasant experience, particularly when you're in your early 30s and you have to get off the train six times in the morning just to get into the city of London. Um, so I was really struggling and just had no idea. Um, basically, I went to the doctors and they said that I could take a tablet with every meal in my life and that would help the IBS. It's just one of those things. Um, I tried it. It didn't work. So I went back to the doctors and they said, oh, we can send you for CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. Sometimes it works on IBS. So to cut a very long story short, I went along and in my first session, I was diagnosed with anxiety. And 10 weeks later, my anxiety and my IBS had completely gone. And I haven't suffered with either of those since. So I then set about trying to continue to heal myself and to learn all the different things that I could do that would prevent me from having that experience that I had before. Um, and yeah, it took time. I'd love to say it was six months progress and woohoo, I was healed, but this is an ongoing journey and I'm still working on myself today. But everything that I've learned, I've kind of put into practice and I've studied hard. I've qualified in lots of different modalities. And today I now work as a life coach and a wellness consultant. I also still have my hand in events because I help other coaches run events. Um, I host retreats myself. Um, so, yeah, that's a, a real whistle stop tour of who I am and why I'm here today. Which is an amazing, amazing story, amazing story. And just uh, the resilience of that as well. I always find it very inspiring when I hear other people's stories. But it, it's not a story that we haven't heard before. No, unfortunately not. In the events industry, is it? Is no. It? no, and I'm still hearing it now, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So um, it's absolutely fantastic to hear those personal stories to try and inspire people to listen and get the help and stuff that they need. Mm -hmm. And it, it's it's in terms of your experiences of stress. And at, the, yeah. at some point in the conversation as well, I'd like us to go back to that kind of conversation, at that point about IBS and mm -hmm. stomach complaints and stress it'd be great yeah. for so remind us to go back on that and try and explain that to a few people because there are links yeah. between mental health and physical health in terms of your gut as well but remind us and we'll, we'll go back to that in in a, mm -hmm. in, in a little while but in terms yeah. of your experience of stress what what were the challenges you were facing working in the industry what were the things that you were finding 
so stressful and those pressures and stuff what 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 do you think it was that was that was leading to your stress the most so a lot of um stress basically is our own internal interpretation of what's going on in the world otherwise we'd all experience the same stress and not everybody was experiencing what i was experiencing so i had a lot of my own personal demons that i needed to work with and i would put that as the top thing so the experience that i was having externally to myself was effectively the trigger that brought this to light so i was working in a really busy contract i was working as a, a senior manager in contract catering for a very large uh, american bank I was very blessed, <laughs> I'm saying that with sarcasm, to be managing the building that had all of the, the traders. So I had about seven floors of traders. And if anyone's ever watched Wolf of Wall Street, it's true. <laughs> okay. So they, they were my customers. Um, I had a wow. really de demanding client. I had a really demanding bosses. And we had a budget the size of, well, like you'd probably fit it on a postage stamp. It was that small. But so I had a lot of pressures externally. Um, I'm a little bit of a perfectionist, as I think a lot of people in the event industry are. We've trained ourselves to to create perfection. So I was really struggling to cope with all of that. My office at the time was in the basement of the building. I didn't see daylight Monday to Friday at all because I'd be in the city before the sun came up and leave after it went. I drank a lot of alcohol. I used to smoke. I drank a lot of coffee. I had an appalling diet. Um, and I didn't ever allow myself to feel my feelings or my emotions. I didn't want to feel anything other, ha other than happy. So I'd numb everything else out. Mm. So I would love to say that it's external factors. It's a big contributing part of that. But I don't believe that we're victims in this world. I believe that we can create our own destiny um, and I look back at it as a gift because I wouldn't be where I am today talking to you all if I hadn't had that experience. But I certainly also wouldn't want to go back and experience it again because it was hideous. Um, it, it was really uncomfortable. But from then on, I moved into some other jobs and the stress just increased because the higher up I went in my career, the more pressure there was. But also my values were diluted. I joined the industry because I love people. I love to give people an amazing experience. I still love to do that today. And I get to do that with what I do without all the politics above me. But the politics and the red tape um, really wasn't congruent with who I was. I was living a life that was not me, you know, not true to my values. I was very masculine in my energy, trying to manage teams of thousands of hundreds of people and all sorts of different things in a, in the way that wasn't really me. So when you put all of that together, you can understand why I went through what I went through. And I think everybody can probably find elements of that, those threads if you're experiencing stress. Mm. Um, but I would always encourage someone to look beyond the external rather than blaming somebody else and saying, this is why I've got this. There will be something inside of you that it's kind of bringing to the fore for you to look at. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And your personal story there sounds so, so similar to my story as well oh, exactly wow. in exactly that same kind of way but from a yeah. I mean I worked on the venue side very similar mm. to you going into work quite early still dark yeah. not coming out until yeah. dark because you're yeah, entertaining clients and so they're very very mm. similar in terms of the, the pressures and those pressures I think the, the biggest danger isn't it is is a lot of the time it's the pressures that we place on ourselves oh totally those expectation the perfectionism do you want to yeah. expand on the perfectionism a little bit? I'm quite yeah. interested. I, I kind of say there's no such thing as perfect. It doesn't exist. But back in the day when I was in a similar situation to you, yeah. struggling to manage stress, drinking too much, drinking way too much coffee, eating yeah. all kinds of rubbish, really, yeah. just, just to keep me consistent on a 16-hour day. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. yeah. So what's what the perfectionism? Perfectionism. I think the other thing we've got to bear in mind there are similar personality traits that attract or are attracted to certain roles and certain jobs like if you're not a people person you're not going to go into hospitality and events mm. if you're not got some level of um high standard you're not going to achieve very much in the event world either because you need that skill to deliver an exceptional event so let's not look at it as a bad thing um but also you've probably heightened that 
that natural skill inside yourself by the way you've worked over however many years you've been working in the industry. And how you do one thing is how you do everything. So if you are looking for fault in everything in work, you're going to look for fault in everything in your life too. So, um, yeah, I'm not saying it's a bad trait, but it's a bad trait if you're you're using it to beat yourself up over the head yeah. with it. Um, so it's kind of like with me, I've kind of learned discernment where I don't apply it into my day to day life. Like I do a lot of content in the work that I do. I record a lot of video. I do a lot of speaking. Um, and you know what? If I say something wrong, it doesn't matter. I'm just trusting that people are going to get the best that I can deliver. If I do a spelling mistake, it's not the end of the world. Ten years ago, I would have been beside myself. But when I host an event, little poly perfectionist does still come out. And I'm happy with that because I want my customers to have the best retreat experience I can give them. Um, so, yeah, I, again, it's it's making it work for you. Yeah. Absolutely. And I like that point that you made as well. It's when you use it to beat yourself over the head with it, when you're using it to attack oh, yeah. yourself, when you're using it to make things harder for yourself, when you, it's all about that yeah. self love, isn't it? It's, I suppose it, it's all right. Yeah. To be, you, you believe in perfectionism, that's your way, but don't use it as a, as a, a, mm. a mallet to hit yourself on the head with. And remember that self love and that kindness and stuff towards yourself. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, we've all got inherent personalities that we're born with, and we can't really change the core of who we are, but we can dial up and dial down personality traits to make them yeah. work for us. So if you want to keep that perfectionist streak, don't worry about completely getting rid of it, because that's what's probably making you a, a really good uh, event professional. So, yeah, but make it work yes, for you. Yes, absolutely. That's, that's, nice. that's a nice note there, make it work for you, definitely. So in terms mm. of kind of managing those stresses, at the moment mm -hmm. today with the pandemic yeah. and C19 and everything that's happening and obviously we're all facing stresses on a completely different level now and pressures on a completely different level now because effectively the live elements yeah. of what we do um, is shut down mm -hmm. and that's one of the things that I like to kind of say to people it's just the live element that's been shut down mm -hmm. there are other things that we can be doing yeah um, to, to still do mm -hmm. what we do, not quite in the same way. Yeah. So, what what can people? What's different about people managing stresses at the moment in a pandemic to how it would be normally? <laughs> yeah, for what is normal. <laughs> yeah. So, I think the first thing we need to remind ourselves is that we are stressed. Whether you can admit that to yourself or not, every single person on this planet is feeling a form of stress from this situation we're human we can't not so therefore your body is already full of cortisol more than it would normally be so things are going to trigger you to be stressed a lot quicker than normally you can be uh, for example i'm i'm pretty much a, a chilled person but i can get really triggered by seeing somebody flouting the rules because i'm all about people so if i see somebody doing something that's unsafe i'm like oh, oh and, and i can feel that whereas normally like pre-covid you know i don't really care what someone else is doing it's their life but in this situation you can feel it's heightened so that's one thing to be really aware of and it doesn't mean that you're ill or there's anything wrong with you we're just all living with excess cortisol in our bodies mm -hmm. um so the other thing is, and I, I was say right at the beginning of the pandemic when I was doing loads of talks, I was talking about, and this is a phrase I love, is control the controllables. And this is the only thing that we can ever think about because we weren't in control anyway. You know, like an event can cancel. Something dreadful can happen. I mean, this sounds a bit doom and gloom, but life is an amazing little roller coaster of surprises. So the rug, yes, has been pulled out from under our feet. But what if we can trust that this is happening for a better reason? And what if we can just go along with that and learn from this experience and control what we control, which is ourselves? So instead of worrying about, oh, my God, when can I go and work again? I mean, that's probably not a great thing to say because, you know, we are going to worry about that. Um, let's say, when can I go on holiday again? You know, that's not an essential thing to your life. And we can create holiday in a different way. Um, it's just looking at what you can control. Am I taking care of myself in the best way so that my mind is as healthy as it can be to cope with the challenges? Because if you start to fill yourself with alcohol and caffeine and like sensationalizing news and what so-and-so who is like now this sudden expert in you know virus control and works in McDonald's Monday to Friday, you know, if we're listening to all of that mm. rubbish, 
it's only going to build those quarter cells cortisol levels higher so control yourself what you can control do the things that make you feel good do the things that allow you to be able to relax and feel in control um those are the best things that we can do and everything is is heightened so if for example you exercise once a day during this pandemic you might find that's not enough for you so you might need to do something else i mean i'm now exercising three times a day which sounds wow. ridiculous <laughs> but i other than that i'm i'm in a in my small house and i'm not moving much so it's, it's finding the things that work for you basically and controlling those and just being kind to yourself knowing that those cortisol levels are yeah, higher yeah and that's that's a really good message isn't it in terms of that control that's uh, a really good mm. that, that message when we, we talk about stress management isn't it that the fact that you can only control the things that you can control you can't change circumstances yeah. you can't really you can you can change your, your environment you're control of yourself and your environment basically and, and that is it you can't change yeah. other people you can't change the situation we're in at the moment you can't do anything about the past as well there's no point stressing about the past and there's no point stressing too much always have an eye on the future for planning and from a strategic perspective but don't have yeah. it too far in the future that you lose sight of the present it's a really good mindfulness exercise as well isn't it that control element control what you can control yeah definitely we all like to be in control and if you were to look at i mean i don't know if you know but i'm sure you do helen but um knowing about maslow's hierarchy of needs so Google it if you don't know. It's really interesting. And you and basically it talks about the things that we need as a human being. Every single one of those foundation levels has been challenged with this pandemic. You know, we haven't had security, even down to the 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 panic buying of toilet roll is to do with the fact that we need to feel secure as a human being. And all stress is is just a fear response. Your body's trying to keep you safe. It's not doing anything horrible. It feels horrible and it's feeling horrible because it's like a little alarm going off in your head going, do something, do something. So it's trying to get you to do something. And if that doing something is just controlling what you can control, then you are going to feel more relaxed and more in control of, of what's going on around you. Definitely. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so the people kind of because we talk about stress a lot, don't we? But there's different types of stress, isn't there? Yeah. It's, it, there's, there's positive mm -hmm. stress and there's negative stress, isn't it? It's positive stress that actually attracts people to the events industry because there's an awful lot of it. It sounds like from your personal story, you're very like me. You throw me into the, the mips of an, of an event and an operation and I'm in my heyday. Leave me in there with all that positive yeah. stress. I'm one of those freaky people that loves it. Throw, throw challenges at me. The more stress, you, str mm -hmm. um, you stress, positive stress, the more of that you can throw at me, the more I love it because I love a challenge. But uh, mm. there's people saying, mm. can we, should we spend a couple of seconds just kind of talking about what stress actually is? The so people understand that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, sure. Well, yeah, so all stress is kind of the same thing. And it's what it is, is your your body's response, your brain's response to an external factor that's triggering your body's belief that something is dangerous so if you take it back to prehistoric times you know if you were living in your little camp with your your tribe the tigers coming towards you you're going to feel stressed and what it's going to do is going to make you take action so physically inside your body there's hormones that are released from your brain that trigger certain things so that one of the first things that happens is your your blood starts to pump faster so your heart beats faster so the blood is going to your muscles because inside your blood is oxygen which is then going to be used to create energy so that you can move quickly or run away in order to get more oxygen in your blood not only is your heart beating faster but you're breathing faster you need to keep that oxygen coming in the hormones also are turning off non-essential functioning digestion is one hence why i suffered with ibs focus long-term focus is switched off your high high state of alert so that you can literally make a snap movement so it's almost like your your kind of rational brain is switched off and you're in your um like your natural state like you'd see like a scared cat or or, or something happening you're you're ready to pounce or run away so that's basically what's going on inside of you and it's all down to your brain's perception of what danger is the problem is 21st century living we will see a pile of paper on a desk as a stress trigger 
we will hear someone say something to us that we don't like and that's a stress trigger and you know the it's kind of what makes our world a little bit different because we've not necessarily evolved from those prehistoric inherent ways we're still a human being with um i can't think of the word i was going to use like instinct that's the word i'm looking for with the same instinct and that's basically what stress is um it's good for you because if you were walking under a ladder and someone was dropping something from the top of this building you want to move quickly but what isn't good for you is when we live with stress long term it's the same thing but it's just it's happening day in day out for a long period of time and that's classed as chronic stress and you then end up with things like adrenal fatigue your immune system is depleted so you're always getting ill your digestion's affected you can't focus um, you know, you might have panic attacks, you've got increased heart rate. So that's where it becomes a problem. And, and really worryingly, 90% of the top diseases today are attributed to stress and chronic stress. So it's in our best interest to mitigate it 100%. So what tips could we give to somebody to, to kind of say how, how they would know if they were stressed? Because there's three different stages to stress as well, isn't there? So, yeah, so to feel if you're not, I mean, I was completely oblivious to the fact I was stressed. I also didn't want to admit it to myself because there was a certain mm -hmm. stigma to that. You know, I should be able to cope. You know, I can do it all. Um, but certainly if you are struggling to sleep um, consistently, I'm not just talking about once a month, but consistently struggling to sleep or you're waking up in the early hours of the morning, your brain is probably a little bit too busy. There's something going on. If your diet is impacted, you perhaps lost your appetite or you're eating too much, um, your digestion is affected, you're suffering with headaches, very tight muscles and tension in your neck, your shoulders, tight jaw, maybe grinding your teeth. Um, these are all signs. Your body is like your body's amazing. And we, we're not a brain and our body aren't separate. They all work together. So but we don't always listen to the tells that our body is giving us. So those are the things you want to really be aware of as, as little signs. And focus, like if you can't concentrate, it doesn't necessarily mean you're chronically stressed, but it may be that you're, you're in a little bit of a, a stress state. Um, but one of my favorite is, is your breath. Your breath is the biggest tell, like just taking some time out every day to just, how am I breathing, you know? And you you do if you could add a little test you can do we haven't got time to do it today but you can do this little test and see how many breaths you're breathing in a moment and that will tell you whether you're in a hyperventilation state or you're in a chilled state um so yeah just listen to your body it will tell yes. you yeah that that's so important isn't it and it's one of the things that you will learn once you start to learn different elements of self-care you start to develop that self-awareness that a lot of us talk about don't you where, mm. where those clues and those little hints and cues that your body was sending you when you were stressed and remember that we're, we're both here talking about we're, we're both coming from places where we've both suffered from that burnout and that chronic stress and we've been in those situations and we've completely worn ourselves out and pushed ourselves to the absolute limit and to try and prove something to ourselves, really. <laughs> um, so mm. we've been there. So we've been there when our body is, has desperately been fighting to send us those signals to say, I, I need you to slow down. I, I need you to eat some healthy food. I need you to sleep me, please. I need you to put my brain to sleep and quiet me down. Mm. And I just need I just need some chill out time and some rest time. It's when you start to learn that you start to recognize those little hints and clues and cues that your body sends you and you you wonder when you when you start going down the well-being track and you have your self-care or you start to develop your practices you wondered how you missed them in the first place mm. well I always say and it sounds really crazy to say it but I didn't know how good I could feel until I did and that's just it sounds just so bonkers mm. to say it but no one tells you these things like I certainly wasn't taught in school like to do with the nutrients of, of what carbohydrates do in my body for example I was taught how to make apple crumble but no one tells you how to manage relationships yeah. or how to manage money all the fundamentals of life and no one tells you how to really take care of your body and we've got to also bear in mind biochemically we're all very different and what works for me won't necessarily work for you mm -hmm. but that's why we we need to learn to 
listen to ourselves your body's your your greatest teacher and as well as your greatest gift yeah absolutely and it is about those messages isn't it and education because basically i think we've all mm. come through school in the education system being told to work hard work hard work hard work hard and i mean that's a yeah. consistent message that you're you're sent everything else falls by the wayside so i, mean, I, I yeah. find it particularly encouraging i am i have i have little little one she's only four she goes to the nursery but when she comes away and tells me that they've done mindfulness and yoga at nursery that day oh. it's encouraging so I, I it's good to see that being introduced into the school system so i know a lot i'm not yeah, quite sure whether it's been introduced into secondary schools or colleges um, and universities yet but certainly in in nurseries and junior schools primary schools and mm. um, well-being seems to be at, a lot at the heart of what they're doing now so how for you how how encouraging how can you see that making a, the, the difference um i don't have children so, but i do have nieces and nephews who are kind of six and below and yeah it's interesting my six-year-old niece I can see that if there isn't work that's done with her, she's going to have a tendency to become anxious. And I think that's because of the lifestyle that we're all living today. We have to have those well-being practices in schools because, you know, we we teach our children how to behave the way that we act. You can tell them something, but they're never going to listen to that. They're going to follow your patterns of behavior. So if you're living and if you've got kids and if you're living a stressed life, you're educating your child that this is normal. And each generation that becomes more and more and more, the more pressures we have, the, the more materialistic our world has become. Um, we're putting these undue pressures on ourselves. So it, it's unfortunate. It has to be an essential item we should have been doing it anyway um but we didn't know what we didn't know back then so yeah i think it's a wonderful thing and i think we can certainly do more and i also believe not just the kids but in in our businesses um and and companies really need to embrace well-being and not just a nod to it with an apple on a friday this needs yeah. to be we're talking about mental health you know we're talking about support I am obviously I'm a coach and I'm biased I believe every person on this planet needs a coach I work with coaches to make myself the best that I can be and, and best for my clients so that would be an amazing thing to introduce into every business some businesses do it already but where is that space then we can just talk and we're humans we need this you know instead of this facade of it's got to be perfect and I'm going to stay the longest hours and work the hardest and get that badge of honor where is that kind of human connection and and the the care that we generally all have for each yeah. other so i've gone off on a slight tangent there you can tell i'm a little bit passionate about no, it absolutely absolutely yeah you can definitely tell as 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 you should be as we all should be to be honest with you because to take it back to what you were saying about maslow's hierarchy of needs health mm. mental health and physical health is at the bottom of that triangle as as a need your health, security, feeling of safety. That's before houses, mm -hmm. car, anything like that has come into place. It's 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 health, it's safety, yep. it's security. Um, that's what we crave mm -hmm. and need as human beings. So all of this stuff that we talk about when it comes down to well-being and mental health, it's it, rightly, as you say, it isn't an apple on a Friday afternoon because you've done really well that week. So let's send you on a cocktail making class. Let's let's gym membership yeah. so that you can go and, and go on a treadmill after you've finished the day this this is all mm. about those cultures isn't it at work those cultures mm. that make you feel safe and secure and um, that's one of the things yeah, that's definitely. so important that's someone for me someone with a mental health condition it's so important that i feel safe and secure within the culture of the work where i am if i don't i, mm. I can't stay there i can't stay there because it will yeah. be detrimental to my health and my stress levels and that all comes mm. down to and it's very personal for some people it's not going to be as extreme as that is it um so why why, why no, is it so look, different for I different think, people well we're all a, a little dynamic mix of personalities um i do personality profiling as part of what i do and love i love it it's brilliant it's just <laughs> yeah and it's brilliant and the one I do is very simplistic, but we're all like a, a combination of personalities. Mm -hmm. But there are kind of six fundamental human needs that we all need, but we need them in different stages. So love is one of those. Variety is another. Consistency is another. Um, gosh, I'm just trying to remember them all. But 
we all need the same things, but at different levels. So for, for you, Helen, and also for me, security is really important for my personality type. And security doesn't necessarily mean that I've got a double lock on my front door and I'm earning an X amount of money. It's It could be like anything. It's like feeling secure in a conversation mm. with somebody that I can be vulnerable. Um, I massively crave variety. And if I do the same thing day in, day out, I turn into a petulant teenager. I need to do something different. But for somebody else, they will want to do the same job every day for the next 60 years. Um, but it's just the dynamic mix of who we are. And none of those are right. None of those are wrong. But what is brilliant is when we can get the right mix of people with those values in the same industry, working together in the same companies or your same friendships relationships that's when real magic happens um and being able to accept people that you know that that's the way that they feel and that's the way that i feel yeah. um that would be wonderful like now we're talking world peace but <laughs> it's um yeah we, we are all different yeah but fundamentally we all want to be loved and liked and respected and live long healthy happy lives we all yeah. want that and we all want to be ourselves as well would you agree a yes. lot of this is about we do. people being allowed to bring their whole selves to every element of their lives so they don't have to wear a mask they don't have to hide behind a facade mm -hmm. they don't have to pretend to be anything they're not and then this is this is something you learn as you get older though as well elaine isn't it that you know the the happiest place mm. that you can be is when you're in your own shoes and you're comfortable in your own shoes and you can be yourself and it's almost like you get that light bulb moment don't you as you get older you can go ah right yeah yeah it's starting to make more sense yeah now. i mean it's but yeah but it's not um an easy thing again in, no. I think in our society when we've got social media that is channeling us that this is how it should be and you know society telling us that I should be you know by the age of 30 I'm supposed to have been married with two kids and I'm neither of those and then you put that pressure on yourself um but yeah it's the biggest travesty that we can't seem to be ourselves because we all want to be liked and loved but we think that to be liked and loved we've got to be like this but nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, imagine if you're having a conversation with someone that's very closed and telling you something that you can feel isn't right. You're not going to have a real deep, connected relationship with that person. If you had a conversation with someone that told you something warts and all, even if it wasn't a great story, you're going to feel that connection because it's truth. Yeah. So, yeah. Because yeah. we're, we're all unique and beautiful, wonderful people, but there's so many similarities between all of us isn't it and that's how we can all connect mm. isn't it with each other isn't it um, yeah definitely. so from a from a stress perspective um what kind of things can make it can agitate it make it worse make it much so all all the things we talked about earlier alcohol it's a stimulant as well as a depressant. It's really toxic for your body. We all like to have a glass of wine, but I used to drink probably a couple of bottles of wine a night sometimes. That really doesn't do your stress levels any good. It might give you that temporary um, relaxing, but ultimately it's going to stimulate your adrenals, stimulate your heart, really not good and good, not good for your brain at all. Um, caffeine, again, is going to mimic the reaction of stress in your body. So if you're already feeling stressed, it's going to make you feel worse. So um, sugar is really highly toxic for the body, increases inflammation. So if you're eating a lot of highly processed foods, you're spiking and making your energy go like up and down, which again is kind of mimicking stress. Um, so those are the kind of things that you put into your body, recreational drugs, again, same thing. Um, on top of that, if you are going into the same place that is creating your stress or where you're feeling that stress, um, that's really not going to help. So if you've got a job, for example, that is really causing you stress and you can't do anything about your own physical health in it, then I would really question why you're still doing that job. If you're in a relationship that's causing you loads of stress and you can't make it better, again, I would question why you're sticking with something because that's going to make you feel worse. So think about your environment physically as well as people. Um, yeah, we talked about food, alcohol, um, not moving your body is a good mm. one, not getting out in daylight. So basically all the fundamentals of, of well-being yeah. um, and what you're feeding yourself with mentally. 
is going to have a big, in, big impact on that yeah, too. Yeah, absolutely. It's all it's all about nurturing your body and mind, isn't it? Um, yeah. What you put in is what you get out. With, we've all heard that statement so many times. You put rubbish into mm. your body, you get rubbish out of your body, and never more a statement. It's ever, and that hasn't changed, you know, and, and that never will change. It will always be the case, was not it? So yeah. it's all about that that love and nurturing that kindness to yourself, that mm-hmm. self-love. Treat yourself in the same way that you would treat, that you that you do treat your best friend. Speak to yourself in the same mm. way that you speak to your best friend, kind of stuff. Um, you know, treat your body and nurture your body in the same way that you would you would say to a friend that they need to do. I think that's, that's one of the big secrets behind it. Would you agree? Mm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, if you keep... Um... Imagine if you had somebody working for you and you kept whipping them and telling them they were rubbish at their job and you were throwing them crumbs of food and then giving them, you know, it's the same with yourself. Like, but when do you ever like stop and look, actually, how am I really treating myself? I still have to remind myself this all the time because, you know, I, I will go above and beyond to make sure that my clients are, are well looked after. And then I kind of want to make sure, hang on a minute, am I doing this to me? Because I can only serve my clients in that level if I am taking care of myself first and it's not selfish and that's something that you I certainly had to overcome that and you know is it selfish am I not being a kind person by taking care of myself and setting my boundaries and going well actually no I can't do that today Um, but these are all things that we need to do and again harping back to children and future generations you're educating them that this is the norm So everyone wins. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's having those life, les- life lessons, isn't it? That yeah, particularly for, for mm. children, because they, they grow up yeah. wanting to be like you, like their like their parents. They want to do what you do. They want to do yeah. their activities and stuff that you do. So it's important to not only have those messages at, at work, if the, but also have mm-hmm. them in your your home life as well. So you've got that balance. Yeah, definitely. it's fine. It's finding the balance, isn't it? How many tips for people in it terms is. of balance? I don't like to say work life balance. I think we need to stop saying it. But finding life balance. Um, like this is such. I love a, a quote, and I can't remember who said this, but one of the things that really rang true for me was to create a life that you don't need a holiday from, and that's kind of my mantra. So if you have a life that you love every day and you fill it with all the things that you really like and enjoy and you're not going to need to worry about balance so much because you're you're already living that. Um, But fundamentally, it's finding the things that make you feel good. And I remember when I was really stressed all those years ago and someone said to me, well, what are the things that make you happy? I hadn't got a flipping clue. I, I'd lost all of that. I just, I was just so flat. But it's a great exercise to do. Like, what do you like to do? What makes you feel good? Like, what lifts you up? And forget what everyone else tells you to do. Maybe it's just like, for me, I like to go out at night, stand and look at the stars. It makes me feel so connected. Or watching the sunrise or the sunset or walking outside or drinking lots of water. Or, But it's finding your balance, finding the things that make you feel good. And certainly when I was very stressed all those years ago, I had like a personality for everything. Like this was work, this was social, this was my relationship. And it was like a different Elaine every time. It was exhausting. But if you can just be you and do all the things that you like and add those into your day, then, every, you know, that's that's balance. That's the way I see it. And let's just also caveat. I mean, I'm a massive advocate of positivity, but you can't just go, oh, everything's perfect, everything's perfect, because life does throw things at us. I mean, look at COVID-19. We're all being <laughs> challenged by this. But if you're living a more balanced life with all the things that you like to do and you're taking care of yourself, you'll take that in your stride and you'll you'll accept and focus on those things that you can control in that situation as opposed to going, right, work is these hours and I'm going to still do the things that make me feel crap. But then when I'm out of work, then I'll do all the exercise, then I'll do my yoga, then I'll do my meditation. That then becomes a chore as well. So that, you know, you're it's not that balance. I hope that makes yeah. sense. It makes total sense to me. I'm hoping everyone that's that's watching, guys, does it make does it make sense? I've realised as well that we've we've got completely carried away, Elaine, been chatting away. Oh my um, god! Q&A, I, talk, I know I questions? talk a lot. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, both of us. Anybody got any questions? So use the Q and A to send in some questions. We'll carry on chatting while while 
people sending some questions hopefully but yeah no it makes total okay. sense and i love what you said i've not heard that, that before but i love that statement have, have a life that you don't need a break from that's just enlightening yeah. and just just a perfect way of, of summing up mm. what what all of this that many of us are talking about on well-being stages and when we're talking about the importance of mental health and self-care it's, it's about finding that that exactly that mm. find having a life that you don't need a break from because it, you, you enjoy it enjoying it and i the point yeah. about positivity as well is such it's such a great one as well there's you can't be positive every day mm. It's inhumane to expect anyone to be on a high every day. No. If you were on a high every day, you'd probably Wait. be diagnosed as having a mental health condition or disorder, by the way. I just thought I'd <laughs> pop that one in there. We're, we're, meant, yeah. we're meant to have yeah. emotions. You're like, we are, we are part of nature, and I think we forget that. And if you look at the seasons, you look at how the animals change, the trees change, we're the same. And if we, were, if we didn't have contrast, how would we know what good felt yeah. like? So we do need those and we need to embrace those. And I know it's, and you know, I know I find it personally very hard if I'm feeling something that's uncomfortable, my old kind of elastic twang is to go and do something to numb it. But the best thing you could do is just sit and feel that emotion, mm. let it ride out. And then, then it goes yeah. um, and not be afraid of it. But just to say about that, the quote about living a life that you you don't need a, a holiday or vacation from. I read an amazing book years ago and it totally changed my life. And I recommend anyone to read it is Bronnie Ware's book, The Top Five Regrets of the Dying. She was a palliative care nurse and she wrote this book based on what people were saying to her. We're so tunnel visioned in our life that we kind of go, well, I've got all this time and you we put things off, but now is life. Yeah. Like it's a, honestly, I, I, I kind of implore anyone to read that and it really will inspire you because I certainly want to get to the end of my days and look back and go, I did it all. I lived everything I wanted to do. I told the people I loved, I loved them. So if you're having a bit of a day when you're feeling like, oh, read that book and it will give you the kick up the backside you need to create a life that you deserve and also that you love. Yes, that's such an important, that, that's, you know, that's one of my toolkits, shall we say it, that I tell someone I love, that I love them every day. And I, I make sure that I oh, do that awesome. to somebody every day, whether that's my mum or my family or, or my, it generally tends to be my little girl most of the time, to be honest with you. Um, but I, gen, I, I tell oh, somebody lovely. that I love, that I love them every day. Um, so I, mm -hmm. and that's a great little tip. Who have you ever said, I love you to today? So I said, try and do that. It's a great little tip with that. Megan sent in a yeah. question. So Megan's asking, yep. for those on furlough, um, do you have any tips mm -hmm. for managing stress when transitioning back into the workplace, whatever that may look like? Yeah, I think that's a mm. brilliant question. Thank you, Megan. And I actually believe the stress that we felt in the beginning is nothing to what we're all going to experience now, particularly going back into work. And I'm guessing, Megan, you're saying that from a point of maybe feeling a bit fearful about being around lots of people when we're told, you know, stay away, because your 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 natural instinct is to protect yourself and keep yourself safe. So again, I would come back to controlling what you can control. But the other thing is to be really honest and open with your employer. Tell them how you feel. Like people aren't mind readers. And like we can get very bent out of shape when people don't un like let's bring it into, for example, of relationships. Mm -hmm. Say you're dating somebody and they don't do something you expect them to do. We get all upset by that. Know how I feel and they should know what the, but they don't know because we haven't <laughs> told them. So your employer is mm -hmm. the same, you know, so tell them how you feel. And, you know, and I, my view is if an employer is going to be like a bit funny about it then would you want to work for somebody that isn't caring about what your well-being? There's obviously ways that you can express that to your employer if you kind of went, oh, I'm not coming to work today because I'm really scared. It's coming with solutions and thinking about how can I do the work that I was doing, but maybe in a different way. So I don't know, Megan, whether you can do work from home, maybe the planning part of what you're doing or whether it all has to be customer facing and in, in a building. Um, but your employer also has a responsibility to make you feel safe, make you feel comfortable. Um, they don't want you to be ill. They don't want the, the workforce mm. to be um, kind of scared and stressed because you're not going to be um, as productive as you could be. Um, 
but from a personal perspective let's just come back to what you can control and and express how you're feeling that's all you can do there is a great tool as well guys if you want to check it out if you go to the event world website eventworld.org on the resources section there's some tools called wellness action plans now these are proactive action plans that you can um, use as a template to sit down with your line manager and employer or manager and what you do is you go through what your specific stresses or triggers might be things that you're worried or concerned about and basically what you do is you put plans in together in place to kind of try and balance those out to make any kind of transitions or changes as smooth as possible they've all been developed by mind as well so do go and check those out they're a really really great tool um, and there's a new one that's been developed for working from home so i just wanted to i just wanted to slot that one in there that's um, amazing. Th- th- they're great, absolutely great tools. Do do check them out. Do check them out. Um, Louise has asked in, in terms of the book that you mentioned, what was the name of the book again? Yeah. So it's The Top Five Regrets of the Dying. Um, and it's by Bronnie Ware. So B R O N N I E and Ware, W A R E. The A R E. I'll just put it in the, the chat for everybody. Yeah, so top five regrets of the dying. Five regrets of the dying. There we go. It's a real motivational book. Um, I know it sounds quite depressing, but you know, we are unfortunately all going to get to that point one day, but let's make sure we fill our life with as much as we can before we get there. So it's really good book for that. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. And I think we're almost coming to the end, so five two. So just kind of what what top things, what top tips can you give to people to kind of beat beat stress, manage stress? Is it, is it is it beat stress or is it manage stress? Because effectively, can can stress really be beaten? Because it's it's, it's always going to no, be there. No. It, it's how we manage it, isn't it? Yeah. We come well, back how to you manage it. stress. You can't. Yeah, we all get we all still get stressed, but it's learning the things that help you to be able to identify that you you are stressed and what works for you to prevent it becoming overwhelming. So I would say top things is your diet. Look at what you're eating. Very quickly you can change how you feel by what you put in your body as quickly as a week. So get the right vitamins and minerals into your body, zinc, vitamin C, magnesium. Um, You want your omega-3s, omega-6s. You want to get uh, B vitamins, it's gonna help with your energy. So all of those things are gonna really help you. Get your rest, but don't just kind of have a really crazy busy day and expect to go to sleep as soon as your head hits the pillow. You need time to decompress. Your brain needs to process. Um, so give yourself like shutdown time, whether you want to read a nice book or listen to some music or, but give your brain space. Um, it's not for everybody, but meditation has been one of the best things that I have ever done. It's been a consistent practice in my life well over 10 years. And it's what stops me, um, having panic attacks and anxiety Mm. today. Um, if you can find a mindful practice that works for you, it's one of the biggest game changers for stress and using that also to learn to breathe properly for your body. A lot of people do um, kind of, um, oh, I can't remember what it's called, but it's a type of breathing when you're breathing, paradoxical breathing, where you breathe incorrectly for your body. Um, I used to breathe like that as well. So learning to breathe properly, get as much time out in nature as you can. Um, We are meant to be in nature it's our home Mm. not this concrete jungle of city so just spend as much time as you can touch a tree or put your feet in the in the river or whatever you can Um, and I know now it's not very easy but being around people and just to share your experiences and talk openly don't ever be afraid to express how you feel like when you say something to somebody like about how you're feeling you're feeling stressed our fear is like oh my god they're going to think i'm less than or i'm a failure or nine times out of ten that person's either experiencing what you're experiencing now or has been there and they will be so relieved that you are expressing that and it's going to make you closer probably as well because you're having a shared experience um So, yeah, I mean, what else? Exercise, move your body, like so important. You don't have to go and run a marathon, but just do something to shake up that energy in your body. When it's kind of stuck and stagnant, that's how you're going to end up feeling. Um, 
yeah, I mean, there's loads of other things we could do, but I don't, I'm, I don't want to throw loads more information at you and blow your mind and stress you out that way. But yeah, just fundamentally, the things that make you feel good and, and do those. Brilliant. Brilliant top tips. I don't think I've nodded so much in the event world course. I feel like I've been doing that all the way through. So, oh, I just thought that was your normal, Helen. <laughs> no. <laughs> but brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Some great, great oh, insights, you. knowledge there. Um, really, Elaine is going to be back with us the week after next at the Digital Summit. So if you haven't had a chance to take a look at that, please do take a look. Find details on the Event World website. Again, it's happening on the 14th and the 15th of July. Um, so it'll be a, a pleasure to welcome Elaine back in. Oh, thank you for having me. It's been lovely to, to be here. I really enjoyed talking to you. I could talk to you for hours. Lovely, lovely. And we're, we're going to do a little bit more networking at the end now. So if anybody wants to stay behind and have a quick chat with Elaine afterwards, you're more than welcome to do that. But um, without further ado, thanks so much, Elaine. Pleasure. Thank you for thank such you for a great me. chat. And uh, we'll see you again in two weeks. Yes. yes, thank you. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Bye.